Now, with the end of the Cold War in the 1990s and the reintegration of, you know, the global marketplace, there has been a sharp reduction in terms of the building of factions and military alliances and things like that. Um, so what you've seen over the past 20 years is that the new divide in the world is not political or military anymore. Now it's economic. And that divide is what we know as the global north and the global south. Um, again, commonly referred to as the first world and the third world. And the relationship between the two is, is pretty complex. The global south represents developing nations, meaning nations that are industrializing or are pre-industrial. For the most part, the majority of them are located in the Southern Hemisphere. They are former colonial states. They have mainly export and production economies, meaning they provide the majority of the raw materials to the industrialized world. Um, they also rely on the global north for corporate investment, technology, economic aid, and cheap consumer goods which makes them highly success, susceptible to cultural and economic imperialism, especially when it comes to the influence of large multinational corporate corporations. Um, they also are the main source of global labor because they are also the fastest growing portion of the world's population. Now, on the opposite side, you have the global north. These are the more developed nations. These are the industrial or even post-industrial service economies like what we have here in the United States. Now, these geographically are mainly located in the northern hemisphere. They are the former imperial states. They are mainly, like I said, service economies. They rely on the global south for raw materials, for cheap labor and for open markets for their goods. In return, they provide economic and humanitarian aid and get free trade as their reward. Um, they also provide the majority of the world's media and the majority of the globalized culture. This is the main source of consumerism. This is These are the areas that drive the global marketplace. <laughs> Right. So this map shows you um, kind of the dividing line between the global north and the global south, although this dividing line is changing. Um, the fact that China is still colored red on this map shows you that it's a couple years old. Um, China is is probably consider would be considered part of the global north at this point. I mean, they're generally a fully industrialized state. Some of those South, you know, some of those Southeast Asian countries would probably start to be turning blue at this point as well. Now, this global marketplace for all of its wonders and its cheap t-shirts and its fast service um, prevents or presents a number of problems. The first and foremost is the exploitive relationship between global south and global north and what we've seen over the past 20 to 30 years is that many parts of the global north are willing to use their soft power in order to maintain this standing relationship this kind of willing mercantilism right so because of that there is a growing disparity in terms of economic achievement between both sides meaning again that the majority of wealth is accumulating at the top, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, and most of this is built on the back of the global south, either through exploitation of natural resources or land or the exploitation of cheap labor, either migratory labor in the global north or migrating jobs um, by transnational corporations, right? And again, what this means is that the global south is essentially, you know, David versus Goliath. Um, they are not only dealing, they're not only 
combating the soft power of the larger, more developed countries, but they're also combating the entire globalized market. Um, and in some cases, that means economic sanctions, that means the withholding of aid, you know, limited military action. And this has all benefited the global north dramatically. Um, there are more billionaires alive now than have ever been alive in the history of the in the accumulated history of the human species right as of 2015 there were 1826 billionaires in the world and the combined wealth of those 1826 people was over 7 trillion dollars that is astounding to say the least to put it this way 7.5 trillion dollars is more accumulated wealth than about 90 percent of the existing governments on the planet now this cartoon demonstrates um the relationship between global north and global south pretty well um the mass consumerism of the global north is fed by the raw production of the global south and this is a constant battle between the two um and that battle has serious implications economically politically and environmentally so one of the more negative side effects of globalization is the massive environmental restructuring that is taking place as we expand in terms of numbers as we in, expand in terms of our our reach and our influence right and this is plainly obvious in multiple aspects um one of the one of the most noticeable and at this point it's actually even noticeable from space is deforestation um by 2011 we had basically harvested about 45% of the existing world forest, meaning that at the rate that we were continuing to deforest the earth, we would eventually harvest all of the global forest by sometime around 2060. Um, at the same time, energy consumption is on a continual rise we all want more power more electricity we want more devices more conveniences right um and as the demand for energy continues um until we find renewable sources of it the process of energy consumption and energy production especially in the global south which is still in the early stages of industrialization is increasing air pollutants and these have led to a number of things namely ozone erosion global warming the greenhouse effect um we, there's also thanks to mass consumerism problems with solid waste meaning non-biodegradable waste uh the largest and most disgusting of these examples is what's known as the pacific the pacific garbage patch which will see here in a minute um we are also wreaking havoc on the plant and animal world there have been numerous animal extinctions over the past 50 years either from poaching or habitat destruction we are also um, reducing plant biodiversity as we genetically modify organisms to create um you know kind of super foods um we are essentially creating it's like introducing a new predator into a foreign habitat um, with no natural enemies these genetically modified organisms essentially destroy the existing plant life in an area and completely take control so we're also you know exterminating certain plant species some of which we've really haven't even studied their their impact or their usefulness um, on top of all of this, you also have man-made environmental disasters. Some of the most destructive um, have occurred in the past 30 years. Um, you have the Exxon Valdez oil spill, where a, um, a oil tanker 
um, ran aground off the shore of Alaska and spilled a couple hundred million gallons of crude oil into the North Pacific Ocean. You have the Chernobyl disaster um, in 1986 that sprayed um, radiation into existing wind currents and caused radioactive fallout across all of Eastern Europe. Um, you have the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico several years ago. Um, you also have the Fukushima uh, reactor meltdown in Japan several years ago, um, which has, you know, not even, we haven't even begun to recognize the impact of that radioactive leak into the Pacific Ocean as of yet. Um, it will probably be another decade before we can even point at what our real effects of that as well. So this map uh, from 2005 demonstrates what we have accomplished in terms of deforesting our environment. Um, now, we'll talk in a minute about the green movement and efforts to reforest, um, but at the rate we are currently consuming it, um, we will eventually remove the entire forest covering of the planet um, if we do not change the direction that we're headed in. So here is a picture of probably at least what I consider the most disgusting part of our environmental restructuring, and that is the Pacific Garbage Patch. So for those of you that don't know what the Pacific Garbage Patch is, um, because of recurring water currents in the Pacific Ocean, um, large amounts of non-biodegradable waste, essentially plastic, has essentially just floated out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it has begun to circulate and accumulate. And currently, there are two massive garbage patches just basically floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, now, because of the size of them and because of our inability to know how, what is exactly underneath them, um, we don't know exactly how large they are, but basically combined, the two garbage patches are roughly the size of Texas, California, and Florida combined. So we have essentially created a floating environmental disaster in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which at this point we have no answer for. Uh, these are some aerial pictures of the Exxon Valdez spill in the 1980s. Um, you can see uh, within hours you had millions of gallons of crude oil pouring out into Alaskan waterways, which again, cause a massive loss of animal life. Um, killer whales in the region were almost run to extinction. Um, basically, the salmon runs for the next three years in Alaska did not happen. So the salmon population of the North Pacific was cut almost in half because the salmon had um, no, did not have the ability to reach their seasonal breeding grounds. 